In this episode of This Week in Space, we wade into the orbital junkyard, the dangerous mass of millions of bits of space debris orbiting our planet. Up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number three, recorded March 18th, 2022. The Orbital Junkyard. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV has everything you need to level up your IT skills while you enjoy the journey. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscription for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code TWIT30 at checkout. And by Blue Land. Sometimes in order to go green, you've got to get blue. Blue Land, that is. Blue Land was founded on the belief that a cleaner planet starts by reducing waste while creating powerful, effective cleaners for your entire home. Get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. Welcome to This Week in Space. I'm Rod Pyle, your roving editor of Ad Astra Magazine, here with the legendary Tarek Malik of space.com. How you doing, Tarek? Doing well, Rod. Doing well. Hey, you'll be shocked to know I have a joke for you. I'm, I'm all ears. I can't you wait. are okay. You, you're vibrating. You're so excited. Hey, Tarek, did you hear that NASA actually launched a herd of cows into orbit? No, no, Rod. I did not hear that. It was a herd shot round the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love also, it. in in lame NASA faux NASA news, a group of students are designing a new rocket that updates its Facebook status as it launches. It's an attention seeking missile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That one was good. I think that laugh was almost real. All right. So we're actually here today to take our our friends and our audience through a tour of the swimming mass of debris orbiting our planet, known as orbital debris, which is a looming clear and present danger. So warm up your radar and prepare for evasive maneuvers. But first, we're going to go through some headlines. Let's do it. Let's talk about the Energizer helicopter. So we've AKA got the Mars helicopter. Ingenuity, right? Ingenuity, right. Mars helicopter that went up on the Perseverance rover. It's flown 21 times, and it was designed to fly. They were expecting three flights, hoping for five. They got 25, which is pretty amazing. So they've extended the mission once again. It's been doing this for a year, so it's rolling into a second year of operation which I think is, is is pretty amazing. We always expect JPL's hardware to extend its warranty or to work past its 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 warranty, quote-unquote, its primary mission. But this is pretty amazing. And uh, from what I've read, we're entering a whole new regime of terrain here as we move into the, the delta in Yezero Crater. So, yeah, I mean, this is like a, a really big deal. You know, we didn't think that, uh, uh, that Ingenuity was going to get much more beyond the month that NASA and JPL had agreed on. There's always a lot of talk about could the the team even support the helicopter team um, uh, uh, as well as Perseverance. And this seems like they've gotten a bit of a handle on how how they want to operate this this kind of reconnaissance drone in that kind of a mode. Now it's not really like a a test vehicle anymore. They're using it to kind of look around and and scout the terrain ahead of time. Um, I just think it's really interesting that it's like a like a little leapfrog type of a process where Perseverance will drive a little bit and then the helicopter will pop up and, and fly over and then land and then wait and Perseverance will drive some more. So it's, a, it's, it's really nice to see this, this little drone that could do so well. Yeah, and, and you bring up an interesting point, which is this thing uh, originally when it undocked from the underside of the rover and dropped to the ground. <laughs> un, un, uh, undocked is, is gentle. They just dropped it. <laughs> they just dropped it. <laughs> But I think a lot of folks, at least people I was talking to, thought, oh, oh, so it comes back into a to a dock to charge, right? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Once it was separated from the rover, the only thing that keeps it linked is a radio signal. So as you say, the rover drives and the helicopter catches up or the helicopter flies ahead and the rover catches up. So never again will the two meet except in general proximity. And uh, it's operating off of a small solar panel above its propeller. Uh, the nice thing about being a Mars helicopter, of course, is when you go up and move around, you have a chance to shake off some of that dust that may settle on your solar panel. So that's that's a good thing. But uh, this this new region rises up about 130 feet above the uh, the crater floor from where they've been, 
and it's it's kind of rough and it's got cliffs and some angled surfaces and and uh, angled flat areas and sandy pockets so it's entering new terrain which is a bigger challenge for the rover than it is for the helicopter i mean it wants a safe place to land but it's pretty light and it's got a nice uh, wide set of feet there so it's not going to tip over but still it's a new regime and every time they they change uh, the kind of terrain they're flying into or the conditions they're flying in that's different. And they're also extending the altitude and the range and the speed it can fly. So it's now allowed to go above 50 feet. It doesn't have a software limit there and is, a lot, is, is going to be allowed to fly a little further and faster, which all adds up to better reconnaissance for the rover. So as you point out, this started as an experiment just to see if they could do it. And I thought that they were going to end this after solar conjunction because my understanding was that they were done leapfrogging, but apparently not. And this has been extended possibly as much as another year. So I think that's really astonishing. You know, I think I think that you can probably expect that this little helicopter will keep flying until it can't anymore. And uh, and that NASA will find the money. You know, there was actually a lot of questions before Perseverance even launched if this if this, if ingenuity, uh, as it came to be known, it was just Mars helicopter for for years as a concept, was even going to be added to the mission, and they added it kind of, you know, down to the wire to as late as they could. Um, when then then administrator James uh, uh, Jim Bridenstine was the one that said, "Yeah, we we should really do this. We've got it. We've got the technology. Let's try it." And uh, and they were able to get uh, to get to get it on on board. And, and now it's paying off in space. You know, they they thought maybe one month, like you said, a a few flights. They're crossing this region called I think it's, you pronounce it Sita. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But they got to take three flights to get across that. Um, to get a, a, across that uh, that area uh, to, to do the scouting for Perseverance. All right. Well, that's exciting, and fingers crossed for it to last another, well, heck, the way some of these, uh, the rover projects go, maybe it'll last the full 20 years of the life of the rover. <laughs> Probably not. But, um, hey, next. Well, we, yes? I was just going to say, Perse uh, uh, Perseverance's predecessors, ooh, that's uh, hard to say, like, 10 times fast. Um, uh, but Spirit and, op and Opportunity, those, those rovers lasted, you know, many, many times more than their three months. I think, what was it, like a dozen years or so for, well, for Spirit Opportunity? Spirit was, I think, uh, six years? Maybe not even that much. Spirit was fairly short-lived, but Opportunity, yeah, I think 14, 15 years. Yeah, yeah. And that's on solar time. panels. Exactly. So you get, exactly. You know, you get perseverance with a nuclear power pack on the back, and now you're really talking about something. Speaking of talking about cool technology, although not the most up-to-date technology necessarily, we saw... The rollout of the beast yesterday. Finally, the space launch system came trundling out. Well, trundling might be a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> came slowly, slowly rolling out of the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center yesterday. And uh, I just got some pictures from one of our reporters there. I assume you've got a, a few of them as well. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty spectacular. It, it It's... Uh, Delivery is not quite what we had expected from early, early on. There was some some talk about possibly painting the main tank white. That didn't happen. We've gone back to what we did with the shuttle, which is just that bare orange foam. But it's the first time we've seen a great, big, tall, spectacular moon rocket roll out of that thing since 1975. That's right. That's that was right. the moon the, rocket. The... That was a Skylab rocket, but big deal. Well, well, and 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 so this this is kind of the 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 the, the end all. It's been about 18 years since the original yes. version of this rocket was was laid out on paper back then for the it was it was a version of it Ares 5 for constellation 5, program right? uh, then it became a space launch system and uh, and now here it is for Artemis I mean we uh, just just getting to this point seems like like a major milestone and there is that thread there you mentioned uh, you mentioned rod that 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 kind of throwback to the Saturn V era, the Saturn rocket era, uh, the same crawlers that they used for that, they used a crawl, the, the, the DePaulo vintage era crawler for this one too. Our writer, our senior writer, Chelsea Goad was there. She said it was amazing that it looked spectacular. Um, you know, it, it is NASA's most powerful rocket, you know, since the the Saturn V. And, and this is, you know, if everything goes well, this would be the, the rocket that will launch the, the next, uh, people, the next uh, astronauts to the moon, uh, if all the tests they're going to do work. It took about 11 and a half hours for them to roll out of the VAB, yeah, the Vehicle sure. Assembly Building, High Bay 3. 
uh, on its uh, its the special carrier, and uh, it just settled down actually early Friday morning, early this morning at four fifteen a.m. is is what they said. So three hundred twenty two feet, pretty pretty big rocket to get up there. So um, we'll have to wait. I wonder what that elevator ride is going to be like to get to the top of that thing. <laughs> so. So we're going to talk about this uh, probably next week, unless another major story intervenes. But um, it's interesting. It, it's constantly touted as NASA's most powerful rocket yet. And yet, because of that upper stage design, it can't loft as much mass to the moon as the Saturn V did, yeah. which is it, kind of counterintuitive. So it, it took a very long explanation that I had to read to completely understand why that is. But nonetheless, it's a great big rocket. It's cool. Uh, it's, it's, it's validated to carry people long before Starship will be. So, you know, fingers crossed that everything works out. It's going to be expensive to launch, but at least we've got it and and that's good. And with any yes. luck, we'll see it taking off this summer and we'll see which one of us owes the other one. What was our bet for? Uh, oh, I was, well, get, I, was I wanted like, your chair. <laughs> I'm not going to give you Star my chair. Trek chair. <laughs> Okay, it's a matter a of public record. A we'll meal. discuss that. Um, All right. The the no, you know, you mentioned the livery. I'll just point out the fact that NASA has really leaned into their old school worm logo from the uh, what is that from like yeah. the seventies and eighties, and yeah. uh, and so on the side of this towering rocket is just the giant NASA worm, um, and it's it's nice to see that kind of legacy in there. Um, I think a lot of people think it's really retro now, and so it's just an example of leaning in. But you see ESA's logo is on there, too, because uh, yeah. the Orion spacecraft is on this rocket, and there's a European service module on it. Uh, so it's already an international partnership going on. Well, uh, and, and, going on and, and we, don't, we don't paint out our partner's logo like the Russians do. And speaking of the <laughs> Russians, that's right. Uh, just a quick one. We have uh, comrades still working hand-in-hand -in, -hand in orbit. So we're told that operations are continuing as normal aboard the International Space Station, despite the war in Ukraine, which is good news. I don't think any of us really thought they were going to come to blows and there might be a little less conversation going on than there was in the past, but they're still getting along, which is good. And as I think you discussed last week, uh, last week, astronaut, U.S. astronaut Mark Vanderhey will still return to Russia aboard the Soyuz at the end of March which would have me chewing my fingernails a bit, but uh, he says he's not nervous and, you know, he's an astronaut. The other guys are cosmonauts and they'll, and they've been the training right thing, together. They've been training together for years. They've lived together for uh, nearly a year. So there's an esprit de corps there that I think is a little bit mm -hmm. transcendent of a lot of the political lines that we have uh, here on, on our planet. Um, and they're not, they're not alone. It's things are still busy. There was a spacewalk by two American astronauts at the space station this year right. that went off just fine. Uh, three cosmonauts just earlier today, as we were speaking, um, uh, launched to the space station. They're going to arrive this afternoon. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, things, things seem to be going apace. So, uh, Mark Vanday, he does come back to earth on, um, on March 30th and he is the record holder now for the longest space flight by an American astronaut getting, uh, getting longer every day until he comes back to earth. So, well, that's cool. And that's all good. Uh, but I did note that, um, that NASA is still planning to test the reboost capability of the Cygnus cargo vessel when it docks, uh, with the ISS in a couple of months. So I guess there is still a concern about the Russians deciding they're done with this in 2024, 2025, and that big question mark about can you operate the space station without Russian cooperation, especially when it comes to keeping it up in a proper orbit, correct? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I think that Cygnus is already at the space station. I believe they launched it last month uh, there. Mm. And uh, But that was, you know, this was before all of the... the um, uh, the, the political issues that the the, the U.S. And, and Russia in terms of cooperation in space have been facing, they, they had planned to do that uh, as a, a new use for the for the vehicle. I'm sure in the, the back of everyone's minds, having that kind of redundancy is good. Um, it will be interesting to see if some of the other vehicles, because Elon Musk has said, hey, maybe they could try with uh, Dragon. I'm not sure Dragon has the thrusters in the right place to do that. Uh, but uh, if other private companies, I think Boeing is only the, the only other one right now, uh, might be trying to follow suit and, and build that capability in. 
But we know Mr. Musk can do it if he wants because he'll just rig something. All right. Well, <laughs> this has all been grand. Um, let's take a quick break to uh, hear about our sponsors. And next up, the Orbital Junkyard. We'll be right back. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Now, if you're a regular listener to this show, you know that we're entering a new space age. Between NASA, Space Force, and companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and dozens of others, they need people qualified in IT. These skills are more indispensable than ever. IT Pro TV can be a stepping stone to a career in the most exciting adventure of the 21st century. Are you thinking about getting your CCNA certification? Having your CCNA shows your knowledgeable and networking fundamentals, IP services, security fundamentals, automation, and programmability. IT Pro TV has the classes and skills you need in everything Cisco. And the month of March is dedicated to Cisco at IT Pro TV. Check out their free weekend, March 19th and 20th, including these courses. Cisco CCT Routing and Switching, 100 through 490, and Cisco CCNA 200 through 301, and a variety of others. Learn to get certified in IT in a way that works with your schedule and is actually entertaining. IT Pro TV has seven studios that are filming Monday through Friday, and those courses go from the studio to their course library in 24 hours. They make sure that you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests. You don't want to miss IT Pro TV's March webinars either. On March 24th, check out the Cisco NAAS webinar featuring Anthony Sequera. Don't forget your IT team needs to level up and enjoy the journey. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 for an additional 30% off the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV. Build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. And just like orbiting debris, we're back. So let's talk about the orbital junkyard. If you've seen the movie Gravity, you know the deal. You know what we're talking about. There's a lot of space junk in orbit. This includes old rocket stages, debris from derelict stages that have exploded, defunct satellites, crash satellites, bits of icy fuel. Even paint flakes are enough to do damage at the speeds that things are moving in orbit. And notably, uh, in the bad old days, before we learned to vent rocket stages, and I, I'm not sure that all of them do this yet, but uh, as we went along and realized that upper rocket stages exploded as their fuels froze in orbit, we learned to uh, create vents so they wouldn't do that. But the ones that did explode and or do explode still create tons and tons of orbital debris. Um, so why does this matter? Well, at, at orbital speeds at 17,500 miles an hour, even a little chip of paint the size of a dime nearly took out the uh, front couple of panels of a window on the space shuttle years ago. And big bits are much worse. So you get something the size of a golf ball, let's say, at these speeds, especially if they're moving tangents to each other or against each other, in, in other words, coming in opposite directions. And the amount of energy they're carrying is really tremendous. And even on the solar panels on the International Space Station, for instance, tiny impacts just from bits of dust can create uh, little plasma clouds that can cause short circuits. So there's all kinds of reasons that orbital debris is bad. But the main one is that there's just a lot of material up there. And whether you're talking about being in orbit with it in this bath of space junk or trying to shoot a spacecraft through it, especially with people aboard, it's a real problem. What do you think? Well, you know, this is something that that uh, is not going to go away now, and it's just a problem that will get worse if it, we don't uh, we don't take care of it. There's something like twenty thousand uh, or, or so bits of uh, objects that are that are uh, orbiting the Earth right now that are being tracked. Really, NASA's Orbital Debris Office. They actually have one. Uh, it's called the Orbital Debris Program Office um, uh, under the, the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Department over at, uh, I believe they're at Johnson uh, Space Center. And they've got some stats that say that, you know, while there's 20,000 bits of pieces that they're tracking, there's there there's like like half a uh, half a million marble size objects up there right. uh, in, in Earth's orbit, maybe even uh, 100 million. This is a mind boggling uh, number to me but maybe even a hundred million objects that are like one millimeter, just teeny, teeny, tiny or smaller that they can't even track. That is 
an awful a lot of junk that uh, that is just up there creating this cloud of debris. And think about there's there's two thousand or so satellites up there right now, some, some, somewhere around there, um, and that's stuff that they're kind of swimming in every day. And it, it is rare. Space is is big, so there there aren't collisions. But we've seen it uh, several times. Uh, there was a uh, a, col a crash between two satellites, uh, a, a Russian uh, defunct satellite and a uh, uh, an, an active communication satellite in, in the the mid two thousands that created two huge swarms of clouds of debris uh, that only is going to go and hit other debris and uh, and that's the that's the fear that space agencies and companies that work in space have is uh, once you have one <laughs> debris event. Uh, it it begets other debris, and then that begets more debris, and then you end up with this this runaway cascade uh, called the Kessler syndrome, uh, where you just have a, a massively rapidly expanding amount of of junk that will never get uh, better. Uh, and so there are companies that that need to to look at that and maybe even make a business to to clean it all up. Well, so you brought up some of these numbers and. Um... I, I ain't going to use your your fancy metric system because we're recording this the United States, <laughs> but uh, but uh, let me just refine some of those a little bit. So there's more than twenty thousand quote artificial objects currently in orbit, most non functional. So I think uh, a much smaller percentage of those are actually still operating. So as you said, thirty four thousand pieces roughly are baseball sized or larger. Four thousand four hundred fifty are operational satellites, and the rest is just junk. It's it's worn out stuff or broken stuff or stuff that's that's uh, past its lifetime. 128 million bits, one centimeter, about one third of an inch, in in uh, across in diameter. But even these could puncture uh, a hull of a space station or a spacecraft in the right circumstances, the right speeds. Countless smaller bits, and when we say smaller bits, uh, you know, even something just the size of a BB or a, a pinhead you know, the, the broad end of a pin is enough to do damage to some components because spacecraft aren't heavy. They're built very light for obvious reasons. They have to get up off the ground and into space. And uh, while they have a, a system that they use, which name escapes me at the moment, it starts with a W, of multi-layering materials on these hulls to try and slow these things down, there's only so much you can do. And again, you know, if you're in an equatorial orbit and something's coming in at a polar orbit as opposed to chasing you down, it's coming in laterally at you, the speeds can be just really incredible. Is that um, is that the and, Whipple Shield that you're talking yes, about? Yes, Whipple Shield. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I, I knew it sounded like some kind of a dog breed whippet. So Whipple Shield. <laughs> um, so this is a serious problem. And and this debris tends to collect, and this this is not an absolute, but it tends to collect in the areas uh, that we traffic the most, right? So most rockets go to certain altitudes within low Earth orbit, and that happens to be where the space station and other uh, other crewed operations are are being done and will be done. And this it, herein lies the problem. You know, the place where you most want to be is the one where you tend to most go, and that's where stuff ends up collecting. And then on top of that, as you point out. We have the United States in the past, the Soviet Union in the past, doing lots of ASAT tests, less so in the last 20 years, but still the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians have had fairly recent ASAT tests, some worse than others. I think of those three, the most uh, damaging one, if I remember correctly, was the was the Russian test because of the altitudes at which that uh, that debris cloud is created. Yeah, and that that that's that's the one that that caused the most concern because it was one that it seemed like it, it was operating at international space station air like level uh, uh, altitudes uh, where right. it's, it's debris they're going to have to deal with for a long time, and it just seems extremely reckless. I, I should point out the United States not um, uh, uh, not immune to this. When uh, uh, after the the, the Chinese uh, anti satellite test back in two thousand and seven, there was right. there was a U.S. A U.S. Uh, missile that they launched to destroy a satellite uh, that was falling from space to, um, uh, according to the military, to make sure that, that none of the the larger tanks on that uh, on that satellite, it was called, I believe, USA One Ninety Three, um, reached the Earth and, and contaminated any place because uh, it was falling uncontrolled. But it was also a very clear show 
that they could launch a missile, that the Navy could launch a missile and, and hit a satellite uh, uh, that was that was you know relatively close to the Earth. So, uh, so there there the, we've seen that it just in the you know in in the last fifteen years or so, uh, uh, a lot of uh, demonstrations to kind of show uh, show everyone what's going on, and that's just intentional. Uh, intentional debris events. They meant to destroy that stuff. One of the things that you mentioned about these tanks that, that explode is that if they if something happens with a, an old satellite, let's say that was launched in the in the sixties and it's still up there, and we thought it was fine, but you know uh, it gets pinged by uh, a, a screw or a nut or a bolt that that just happens to to create some other kind of debris event there. And then it starts to move around. Now it's moving in a, in a place where we didn't know where it was before. And the next thing you know, you have a piece of rocket junk hitting the moon that no one expected. <laughs> and that was from 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 China's uh, uh, China's uh, uh, rocket booster that hit the moon. And we were all excited about that, but <laughs> it could e easily have fallen somewhere else or hit something, so hit the International Space Station. That kind of a, a thing is what people are really afraid of. And the space station, as you mentioned, uh, it's solar, solar panels have been dinged by debris. Uh, there's a big old uh, gouge out of its robotic arm from a debris strike. And the Hubble Space Telescope too, uh, when they brought panels home, they're studying how it was pitted over time from from debris to wear it down from uh, not just um, micrometeoroids that's out there naturally, but all of the stuff that we've just left up there or that's, that's fallen off uh, or that astronauts have even thrown overboard. So, well, and, so and it's, it's, speaking of that, I, there's a, a here's a short list of some of the the junk that we know of that's been left up there. Uh, we've lost at least one glove, although I think it's more than that. The first glove, as I recall, drifted out during the Gemini days, but there's been one or two more since then. Uh, tools, a toothbrush. <laughs> Not quite sure how that <laughs> happened. And then the Soviet Union, when they were operating the Mir space station, tossed their garbage overboard, and of course, garbage can have organic components or or water in it. And when that freezes, it becomes ice, and that might as well be a piece of rock at those speeds. Um, and interestingly, and this is one I hadn't heard of, the Soviet Union used to launch a, a series of satellites called Rorsat that were military. They were, they were powered by sodium-cooled reactors, and after a number of years, those began leaking coolant, creating clouds of frozen debris of potassium so sodium alloy. Huh. <laughs> something I'd never even heard of. But as of 2019, 1,400 bits of various pieces of junk had struck the ISS. And I, I didn't realize that, that the number was that high. I knew wow. that they had had a couple of small events. And some of these are very small. And, and a number of them were on the solar panels. And, you know, you can you can ping something through a solar panel. It'll still work. But it does reduce it effect, its effectiveness. But that's a lot. And now, of course, we've got ever larger, you know, in the middle of this conversation, we've got ever larger constellations of these broadband satellites going up into orbit. And uh, according to Elon Musk and SpaceX, there's some AI awareness in the satellites on how to avoid each other and how to avoid other things like space stations that we don't want them to hit. But we're talking about in the last couple of years, just in, excuse me, in 2021, 1,700 satellites were launched bringing the active number the number of active satellites up to about 4850 which is a 30% increase in just 2 years and this is with companies like SpaceX just starting to get their act together in terms of broadband satellites he's got uh, I think we were discussing this last week just under 2000 in orbit now if I remember correctly and he's looking mm -hmm. at a minimum of 12000 and perhaps as many as 40000 and these are all in low earth orbit they're not at the at the altitude the space station is, but they have to launch up to a similar altitude and then migrate past it. So, you know, just the amount of stuff we're adding on purpose that we can track and maneuver unless they malfunction is a little daunting, especially when you're looking at, at launching through this belt of stuff, not just existing at it, but launching through it to get out to the moon. Yeah, and we should point out that that this is a threat. One of the one of the reasons that that we that the the industry is worried about debris uh, is because it if like most of what we do on a day to day basis how you and I are talking it all depends on uh, communication and technologies that that we get from space you know if it's a communication satellite uh, if it's the science if, if you're a scientist the science of the astronauts um, not just on the International Space Station China has their own space station too some companies are planning to build their own private space stations you know that the astronauts we should point out 
have had to take shelter in their return ships several times, uh, well, just many times, I think, over the years, but just in the last few years, at least like two or three times, because a piece of debris got too close, uh, uh, too fast that they couldn't move the space station out of the way in time. There's a, a pizza box shaped perimeter 25 miles across uh, uh, that that NASA doesn't want anything. It's like a keep out zone. They don't want anything that can come that close that could potentially hit this football uh, football field size space station. And um, and uh, and so so those are reasons why people are trying to track all this. And there are some things that they can do. I think you've got a, a list right of what what's being done now. I that we do can talk about. And and I've got that list because uh, it, it, this is just one more fact I want to drop in here because it's a it's a big number I love big numbers. As of two thousand and nine, when there was a lot less of this stuff up there, we were recording thirteen thousand close calls each week, and that's gone up a lot since then. And so we're going to talk about it as soon as we come back from this break. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottle containers are thrown away each year? And if that's not bad enough, each bottle can be made of more than 90% water. That is a serious lose-lose situation for our planet. I recently had occasion to spend a few hours with an astronaut who flew on the space shuttle and spent time on the Mir space station. And when we discussed looking back at Earth from space, his most profound impression was that he was looking at something beautiful and fragile. And most astronauts say the same thing. They're in a unique position to see something the rest of us can't see directly, that Earth is a wonderful, fragile home, and that it needs our help. Plastic has been found in 100% of marine turtles, almost 60% of whales, over 36% of seals, and 40% of seabird species examined. By 2050, scientists predict that the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. So start creating a cleaner planet from home. Blue Land's idea is simple and beautiful. Buy the bottle once and refill it forever. The only thing you need to discard is your outdated idea that eco-friendly products are more expensive and less effective. You just fill Blue Land's beautiful Instagrammable bottles with warm water, pop in one of the hand soap or spray cleaner tablets, and within minutes you have powerful cleaning products in the most incredible scents, such as iris agave, perine lemon, and lavender eucalyptus. From the best-selling Clean Essentials Kit to their hand soap duo and plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, Blue Land has something for every inch of your home. And backed by popular demand is Blue Land's Toilet Tablet Cleaner. Get it before it sells out again. Blue Land's stunning, high-quality, forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit and are meant to be reused forever with money-saving refill tablets that start at just $2. Try Blue Land today. You'll love it, and your planet will thank you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash space. That's blueland.com slash space. Okay, so let's talk about some solutions. Um, yes. The primary thing we need, I think, is is international cooperation because any individual nation could do a certain amount of work to try and mediate how much how much stuff they put up there. They could try and mediate uh, what kind of collisions their hardware is involved in, and they could certainly stop doing anti satellite tests, which would be very nice. But we've got this additional legal problem uh, that needs to be resolved, which is that each not just each satellite, but each bit of junk up there belongs to and is the responsibility of its country of origin. So if you have a Russian satellite that's tumbling out of control and you as Russia are unable to go up and get it uh, secured or brought down to a lower orbit so it'll re-enter, I, as the United States, can't go grab that and take care of it, as I understand, because that is your property. And we still haven't really worked out a legal regime internationally that clearly delineates the responsibilities of countries for their space junk. Yeah, you know, and that that is something that we still have to work out. I think as a as a spacefaring uh, species, there's some stuff that that many of the companies are doing now uh, to to build in an end of life plan. I think that's kind of the first thing that we've been seeing proliferate. Uh, 
in in recent years is most most uh, satellites have a, a ten or fifteen year lifespan is what they're designed for, um, and uh, an increasing number of companies, SpaceX included, that you just mentioned, um, are building in extra uh, extra plans so that when they reach near that end, that they can reserve some fuel to deorbit it so that it, the the satellite would burn up in um you know safely over the pacific ocean or which is like the dumping ground apparently of humanity uh, when, when it comes to things from space um so that that is something but when something does go wrong and then who's responsible for it you know that that is uh something that we're gonna have to figure out you know we've seen satellites fall uncontrolled uh over time uh, china's uh i think they're one of their their Tiangong labs, the early ones, uh, came back to Earth, and they really didn't know where it was going to come, and no one knew like what would would they be responsible for it when when it hit the ground? Is it going to hit over a populated area? And, and luckily, it, I believe it, it ended up just kind of burning up over an ocean uh, somewhere unseen. Uh, but you know, as we've seen with Skylab, and that's a whole other space junk uh, mm -hmm. uh, menace. Um, uh, these these debris events in space, when they fall back to Earth, they can also cause you know uh or risks on on the on the surface too so uh and that that's because big pieces of skylab fell over australia some landed on farms and whatnot and you can go to a museum in australia and see the remains of of skylab there um but let's and, be fair there's a lot of australia to fall into <laughs> that's not going to cause problems i mean people live on this little ring around the outside of the continent and then the rest of it. But, but yes it was a big deal we do want these things to fall in the great pacific graveyard as i like to call it preferably and i think there was a check that was sent to australia to uh, the, from the united states to kind of right. uh, admit <laughs> so way back when so that was Sorry. one example of it. um but uh uh but what, that's always one of the, the kind of sticky sticky areas about space is that if I build my own satellite, I really don't want anyone going up there and touching it because I, right. I put my own technology into it. And uh, and is there going to need to be a, a debris consortium like the UN, but for space junk in orbit um, to yeah. uh, to kind of monitor all of that? There's there's a lot of uh, interest. In, in cleaning up space, but who's going to regulate that? Does it need to be regulated or is it up to a company? Is it up to Intelsat, which has been contracting with uh, Northrop Grumman uh, to get uh, uh, tugs that will extend the life of their satellites? Uh, is it up to them and every single satellite operator to do that? Or should there be like a central service that you can kind of call up like a Lyft or an Uber to come and, and get your junk and, and, and take it out of space? I'd like or like one eight hundred got junk. Like maybe they can just point at it, <laughs> and, and, and right. it disappears. So or the AAA of space. So, so uh, you know, one more thing we should mention is that nature can help. So space weather makes a difference. You talked about Skylab. One of the reasons Skylab crashed. I mean, there were plans to reboost it to a higher orbit with the space shuttle, but the shuttle was running late, and then we had an unexpectedly energetic solar max. Uh, in that period. It's a 13-year period of solar activity, and solar max is when it's the most active. And when you get more energy coming from the sun, a couple of things happen. Um, one is that it, it causes the Earth's atmosphere to, uh, atmosphere to expand, and that caused more drag on Skylab and brought it down faster than we expected. But that same phenomenon can bring down a lot of space junk. So if you've got the International Space Station and the Russian Space Station up in orbit during uh, a, a, an active solar max period with an increased atmospheric density up there. Those can be reboosted to higher altitudes, but all the loose garbage that's floating around up there, uh, not all of it, but but some of the lower bands, let's say, of that is going to be caught up in this, this slightly denser atmosphere and decelerated and, and brought down. Um, and and as, we, as we've... And as we found out, if yeah. you leave your bright, shiny, new batch of Starlink satellites in a very low altitude, <laughs> yeah, that's right. They will uh, also they will they will also be brought back down to Earth uh, a few days after yeah. you put them in space, like SpaceX learned just recently. So, so it is a, a bit of a flip side. You have to plan for it uh, for sure. Um, and that's what some some and, companies are doing that to kind of leverage that that right. that weather effect or just drag in particular to clean up space junk. Well, and something that I hadn't realized is that uh, the, the pressure from, from the photons coming from the sun and the other energy particles can actually uh, navigate some small bits of debris slowly over time back down the atmosphere, which is something I never really thought about 
Um, but as you said, new new satellites are also uh, designed to actively handle their deorbiting or move them up into graveyard orbits. But there's a couple of other technologies I just want to talk about very quickly um, that will help with this phenomenon. One of them is uh, studies on vehicles that can go up and refuel satellites that are properly fitted for for refueling and allow them to either move up into safer orbits or down into deorbiting uh, orbits where they're going to come back and burn up or just to continue their their lifetime. But again, you've got international laws there. You know, you have to get permission from India, say, if you're going to dock with their satellite and refuel it. And of course, that's something they'd probably want. Um, larger objects can be rendezvous with and forced to deorbit with space tugs, as you mentioned. There's also what they call the Pac-Man capture model, which is basically going up with a big set of jaws and grabbing something and, and bring it down to a lower, lower orbit for release. You, you um, know who's doing that is uh, um, mm. uh, Rocket Lab. They have a new rocket right. called Neutron, and the the whole top of the first stage opens up like a giant hippo mouth and then closes. <laughs> so I could see that like swallowing it up like from uh, what is that? Was it not Dr. No? Um, it was you only uh, live you twice, only live right? twice. Yes. <laughs> right, that, with the big alligator mouth. About, we keep very talking dramatic about James music. Bond here. <laughs> I know, but, but it, but it is such a James Bond moment. Yeah. And speaking of James Bond moment, uh, lasers may be That's used right. to, because if you shine a laser, a, a significantly powerful laser, at a piece of space junk, uh, two things happen. One, the actual pressure from the laser can can change the orbit, but more importantly, you burn a little spot on that piece of junk, and the ablation of that burn caused by that burn actually is a brief propulsive moment, and down it goes. Of course, aiming lasers down towards the Earth from orbit gets some people upset, so you've got some, some weapons concerns there that... Yeah, we got an outer space treaty that dates back to 1967 and probably needs to be updated because we weren't thinking about huge lasers in orbit at that point much. Water sprays and electrostatic tethers. I, I had heard of the electrostatic tether because the Japanese tried that, although it wasn't successful, which would impart a charge to these objects and cause them to uh, to deorbit. But water sprays is a new one by me. Have yeah. you heard about that one? No, no. But, you know, just kind of any... Any any way to knock something out of space? Yeah, uh, seems like that would be like a that that gives you a little bit of thrust if you spray something out. So, I can well, see and that. water, I can see you that. know, will turn. I I suspect immediately into ice. So you're essentially shooting an ice stream at it. And the nice thing about that is these are solid objects that will impart a velocity to something in orbit that you want to bring down. But then it just melts, right? It's not mm -hmm. going to render. So um, all this is good, and there's nets and harpoons. Ooh, I, I, I love the idea of space I, I, harpoons, by the way. I was going to say, I, was, I, wanted, I wanted to mention the harpoon because they actually yeah. did it in space. Yeah. In 2019, in 2019 Airbus, uh, Airbus uh, had ran a, they built a, a little satellite called Remove Debris as part of a, a demonstration of how could you uh, clean up space uh, space junk with the Surrey satellite technology. And, and they did this. They, it actually had a, like a pen size harpoon that they shot at a target right. and yeah. and they, they they were able to to, to hit it uh, they also i think that one actually had a net too that it shot at a target it had like all these weird things like a swiss army knife uh, and then it was designed to drag itself out of space with a big drag sail so um so <laughs> there's like all these wild ideas and I, I just wanted to point out that the u.s military is interested not just in cleaning up debris, because of course the US military has, you know, the Space Force has their own satellites. But they've got this new program called Orbital Prime, which sounds like a transformer, I know. But it does. um uh, but they want ideas to not just clean up debris or prevent it or extend the life of a satellite like you were talking about with tugs and stuff. But it's it would be like a vehicle that could go up and say, hey Intelsat, your satellite's dead, but your antenna's still good. I will cut cut off the antenna and I will store it and I will use it to build a new satellite in space that needs that antenna. Um, so recycling this stuff in space before it becomes debris is something that the military is looking at, that some other companies are looking at to create maybe even a new economy that is more, um, that, is, that is avoiding the addition of new things by using what's up there but not needed anymore in a new way. So I think we're still a few years out from that, but the fact that they have a contract out for ideas uh, this mm. year, in fact, um, uh, says that they're they're pretty serious about that kind of uh, that kind of technology. 
And you, you know, Space Junk is such a big problem that it's even caught the attention rod of Steve Wozniak of Apple co-founding fame. You know, he's, he launched a new startup called Privateer uh, that uh, is aimed at like sending up satellites just to track all of this stuff. And uh, so there's clearly a lot of interest of, of pursuing it as, as a service to both warn uh, satellite operators of, um, of possible conjunctions is what they call it when, when a piece of debris is headed towards your satellite uh, or uh, finding ways to clean it all up. And, you know, right now they're just kind of developing the, the, the systems that they need, but they're saying, you know, that, that they're looking at several hundred satellites to go up there and 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 just track everything that's up there and and try to take care of it before it's too late. It's kind of interesting that you want to launch more satellites to deal with more space debris. <laughs> like hundreds. You know, yeah, that could you potentially know, become a problem on their own, but yeah, we'll find ways to bring them all back. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's, there's other companies like Leo labs that, 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 that are tracking stuff with radar and, uh, and what, what privateer wants with the was is to be, as they say, uh, the Google maps of space is what they want to be to kind of map it all out so that, you know, if you're going to launch your, your mission right now, you want, might want to wait like a few seconds if you can, so that you can let that rocket stage fly overhead that you're not going to, uh, crash into on your way up to, to orbit. Uh, or if you need to change orbits, cause you have a really fancy satellite that can do that, uh, that you can do it safely and not, you know, uh, encroach on the lane of another, uh, fellow space traveler. So we, we should also probably point out that Leo labs, uh, is an abbreviation for low earth orbit, not Leo Laporte <laughs> since we're right. on his That's network. Right. Um, so yeah, there's a lot needs to be done here. Great opportunities for private industry, though, and and there's a lot of people looking into that because this could be an area of great profit once it's properly supported, but that's going to require a lot of international negotiations, and that probably will and should go through what is called the UN COPUOS, a rather strangled acronym, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. So we'll bring you more news as we hear it, but that's what we know about orbital debris today. We did get... Roll the fanfare, please. We did get some fan mail <laughs> congratulating us for our um, our episode on model rocketry, but pointing out, as I'm not sure we did, that if you want to engage in model rocketry safely and productively, you should look at the National Association of Rocketry at NAR.org. That's NAR.org, which is an organization, organization that's been around since I was young in the Jurassic era. Uh, although it didn't have a website at the time for obvious reasons. We were still dialing, dialing our telephones. But um, they have all kinds of resources and guides and uh, different kinds of advice on how to do this safely and productively. And that's something we should, of course, encourage because there are people out there, thank goodness, most of them that are a lot more responsible than I was with Model Rock. <laughs> and I think, weren't you an NAR member at one point? Uh, maybe when I was in uh, school, I should probably look to join them again, I think, <laughs> just because I'm getting into it a lot more. So thanks for listening, and we'd love to hear from you, good, bad, or indifferent. So if you'd like to talk to us, please connect with us at TWIS at twit.tv. That's TWIS for this week of space at twit.tv. New episodes publish every Friday, and we're available on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe and tell your friends, all of them. You can head over to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. See you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed, with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.